today. Uh, but I have the privilege of introducing Dr. William Curtis. Uh, I had the f uh, first met him, not personally, but heard him uh, while I was in seminary at um, the best seminary in the world, uh, Sam DeWitt Proctor School of Theology <laughs> at Virginia Union. And he was coming, he came, uh, I was in school for three years there, and he came for two of those years uh, to preach at our convocation, and that's where I was introduced to his preaching. Uh, then I heard him on other stages at different conferences, uh, but he has become a mentor and a big brother to me, and I appreciate him uh, more than he could ever imagine. Amen? Uh, but we're just uh, grateful for his leadership. Um, he serves on various boards. He's seminary trained. He has his doctor's degree. Uh, he uh, leads a wonderful church in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, but I'm glad to, when I'm able to host uh, preachers to come to find out who they really are and to listen to him speak to his daughter and talk to his daughter in such a way on yesterday while he had me on the golf course. Uh, it, it was very impactful to see how intentionally he was were to show her how much he loved her. And so that speaks highly of me more than any degree, uh, more than any accomplishment, more than any conference, but how you love and treat your family. Uh, it speaks highly to me. And so I want to move out of the way and let him come and introduce himself in his own way. Let's give Dr. Curtis a big hand clap of praise. Good afternoon. I told Marcus he's working me these, uh, this day and a half. He invited me to do these two sessions and to preach tonight. And then yesterday when I got here, he said, oh, can you do a podcast in the morning? I said, yeah, Marcus, I'll do a podcast too. <laughs> so I just told him before I stood up, when you come to Pittsburgh, you're doing sunrise service, you're doing both morning services, you're doing BTU training in the afternoon, you're doing the 6 p.m. service, and I'm going to do a fireside, mountainside chat with whoever I can find, right? <laughs> so I'm going to work him like he working me. Let me say good afternoon to everybody. I'm so excited to do this. I'm always excited to engage conversation around preaching, the future, and particularly in this wonderful, creative, imaginative space we're in called On the Verge of Post-Pandemic. And while many people are looking at this as negative, can I tell you, after 38 years of ministry, I'm more excited about pastoring and leading my congregation in this season than I have ever been. And one of the reasons, and we'll talk about it in the second session, is because I get the chance to exercise creative pastoral imagination against the backdrop of a congregation who would treat me with some degree of a hermeneutic of suspicion with regard to pushing the boundaries on technology, getting rid of old sacred cows, um, kind of destroying, I was trying to find a more sensitized word, destroying ministries that are no longer working, reconfiguring staff, and COVID helped me with all of that. And now my congregation is kind of in that place where they're like, whatever we have to do, let's do it. And I'm like, well, I'm so glad you said that, right? <laughs> this session, I want to talk about preaching. The next session, we'll talk about church and what it means for us in the future. Let me put a disclaimer up front on my presentations. One of the things all of us will have to admit no matter who we listen to, no matter what workshops, conferences, we are privileged to speak at, all of us are doing guessing work. Every one of us in this room is trying to discern what the future is gonna look like. And when you listen to a person who wants to act as if they can prognosticate exactly what it's gonna look like, leave your church, give up your robe, turn in your manuscripts, and follow that person because they're a true prophet. Right? The rest of us are doing guessing work, and we're using some calculations to do that guessing. We're using historical analysis to do that guessing, but we're in, and I'll talk about this in a little while, we're in what is called liminal space. We're in a space of mystery. We've never seen this before, and because we've never seen this before, we are, as one author says, we're leading off the map. And leading our people off the map means the only credibility we have is how credible we've been leading them on the map. 
And the trust they have for us is because we've been faithful with leading them on the map, and they're going to hang in there with us while we try to figure this thing off the map. Does that make sense? Yeah. Engage me in the presentation. I am the kind of person that wants to engage the conversation, so cut me off. Uh, challenge it, because everything I'm saying to you is I'm not proposing that this is the only way to look at homiletics or the only way to look at church as it relates to the future. I'm giving you my theories, my praxis, some of my historical uh, connectivity as it relates to ministry, some of my best practices, some of my failures, the things I've learned and gleaned, so feel more than free to engage me in conversation. I would prefer that so that I'll know that I am scratching where we are ministerially itching rather than to get to the end of the presentation and somebody say, well, either that was good or bad, but that's not what I came for. I'd rather hear that up front, okay? So let's talk homiletics in this session. Philip Brooks says, what I was taught my very first class in exegesis, my teacher Evans Crawford, who I admire so much, quoted Philip Brooks as the first thing that came out of his mouth when I was an entering student at Howard University School of Divinity. It is the better school than Virginia <laughs> Union Seminary. It, it's the one that produces scholars and, yeah, and true pulpiteers and you know all that. He said, Philip, Philip Brooks, he quoted, Philip Brooks says, preaching is truth through human personality. Preaching is truth, biblical truth, spiritual truth through human personality which suggests that there cannot be a divorcing of the preacher from his or her preaching. That God is filtering God's word through the vessel God has called. Now, when I was growing up, people who wanted to be deep in their salutations as a part of their prayers would say things like, Lord, hide me behind the cross that I not be what? Seen or? Well, if you were not to be seen or heard, why show up? Right? It was very, very clear that God decided to put treasure in the human vessel. And that faith comes by hearing. Hearing comes by the word. How shall he or she hear except a preacher preach to them? And how shall he or she preach except they be sent? It is very intentional on God's part that the diversity of voices in this room are brought to bear on homiletical presentation. Your personality, your experiences, your background, your traumas, your gifts, your human connectivity, everything that makes you who you are is what makes you so necessary to your own proclamation. So that preaching is Truth through human personality. Now, over the years, I marry that to a quote from Susan Thistlewaith in her book, Theologies from the Underside, where she proposes that you cannot do theology and you cannot be a responsible homiletician without starting with context, personal context. I am a 55-year-old African-American male pastor, husband, father of one daughter, pastoring an inner urban church in the city of Pittsburgh, graduate of three institutions, brother of one sister, son of parents who are still living. That context becomes very revelatory for why my preaching sounds the way it does. I started preaching at age 17, and everything about that context is brought to bear on my homiletics. When you hear me preach, it is clear that I am part of the Omega Psi Phi fraternity, that I am a person who practices martial arts, that I am an addict of golf, that I love my daughter 
like I love myself. All of these things are brought to bear. I have a lens, I have a hermeneutical lens that interprets scripture that I can never divorce the context of who I am from that hermeneutical interpretive lens. Does that make sense? Because I bring me to the text. Every one of us in this room, if we were to read a passage of scripture, all of us could glean from it something slightly different based upon the context out of which we emerge. The things that are surrounding our lives and connected to our lives. It's why when you hear a single pastor or a female pastor or a male pastor or a married pastor, the lens, the hermeneutical interpretive lens becomes different for each one of them because we can't divorce ourselves from our context. And what I want us to do is to own our context, to not divorce ourselves from it. It doesn't mean every sermon has you bleeding your context on a congregation or those to whom you're preaching, but it is brought to bear on your exegesis. You know what I mean by exegesis? Because I don't want to make any assumptions today. You know what I mean by exegesis? How we dig and mine the text so that we can then, from the fruit of exegesis, frame and form our sermonic presentation. Because preaching is not exegetical recitation, it is the fruit of our exegesis. It's taking our study of scripture, filtering it through who we are, and it's the things that we, in conversation with God, pull for as fruit that becomes sermonic presentation. So Susan Thistlewaite says we can't talk theology without first rehearsing our context. And as a result of that, every one of us comes to the homiletical responsibility as a compilation of all of these things, similar to what I have mentioned, that brings to bear on our sermonic presentation. Therefore, seasons don't change that for me. Pandemic doesn't change that. The season of heightened technological success and advancement, meaning the early and mid 90s, don't change that. Who I am as an aging male pastor doesn't change that. The seasons don't change that. The human condition changes that. So if you were to hear my preaching from age 22 when I started pastoring my first church to age 55, where I'm getting ready to celebrate 25 years in this current church, you would say it sounds different. What is different is not what I believe about God, not what is true about Scripture, but what is different is what I have navigated with congregations as part of the human experience. That changes the content of what I preach it doesn't necessarily change all of the convictions of what I preach. So seasons don't change. The human condition changes how the biblical text opens up for us. Now, let me make one more preliminary statement before we begin to, to dig. I am also a proponent of what to me is the Encyclopedia Britannica of preaching. And that is H. Grady Davis's book, designed for preaching. I'm not even sure if you can find it these days. H. Grady Davis says, a sermon must start in the Bible. It must stay in the Bible. It must end in the Bible. That I am not taking some external topic and then trying to find a biblical text to attach to it and create a sermon. I'm not taking some theme that resonates with me in a season and then going to the Bible and trying to find a text to match. H. Grady Davis proposes that you spend time with a text and the text begs to be preached. And the way I like to teach um, preaching students is even if you have multiple texts that you are wrestling with and internalizing and filtering and sifting, if you have multiple texts that are in conversation for which one of them should be the paramount text for this particular weekend, 
let the texts argue against each other for preeminence for this coming weekend. And instead of trying to merge them together, prioritize them, particularly if you're in pastoral ministry, because you don't have to preach it all on one Sunday. If they love you and you're good, guess what they're going to do? They're going to come back next week and hear you again, right? I had to learn that because in younger years, I felt like each time I stood might be the last time I was going to talk to my congregation. So after about 45 minutes, you can see some of the elder saints looking at me like, young man, we'll be back. You, you can say amen. We promise we're going to be back. But I didn't trust that at that point. So I had to tell as much as I could every time I had a chance to stand, right? So it must start in the Bible. It must stay in the Bible. It must end in the Bible. And then here's what else he says. He says, as one of his illustrations of how we think about a biblical text, he says, think about the biblical text as a diamond. That when we hold that diamond up to the light, we see a facet of it based upon how we are holding it right now. But you've got to spend enough time with that text, which is why you can't prepare for the sermon, in my estimation, at midnight the night before you have to preach it. Some people are gifted to be able to do that. So I'm not, I'm not making that as a value statement. If that's all you have to work with, you have to work with what you have to work with. You worked all week long. All you have is midnight on Saturday night to get ready. If that's your context, you've got to work with it and you make do with that. But if you have a context that allows you the freedom to let a text live with you for a while, then he says, take it and hold it up to the light and whatever facet is whatever facet of brilliance is looking at you while you're holding it up, twist it a little bit. And you will notice as you twist it that it has multiple brilliances that are begging to be preached in the text, which is why you can take something, for example, like the prodigal son story, and on one week when you hold it up to the light, you'll focus on the father. And then that next week you hold that same text up to the light and you focus on the prodigal that left. And the next week you come back and you hold that diamond and you twist it again, and it's the prodigal who stayed. Or it's the servants in the house, right? Or it's an example of the God who leaves you with a cliffhanger. And the cliffhanger is what? The younger one comes back in. But we're never told what happens with the older one out on the porch. And each week all you're doing is twisting. Same text, and as you're twisting it, you see a new facet of brilliance. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. So, seasons don't change these things, y'all. The human condition does. The text is then open, explored, explained, proclaimed, based upon how the human condition shifts and transitions. My career spans 38 years, and I've witnessed in my own life the different ways the human condition has changed the ways I expose and expound the biblical text. Let me give you just a little historical framework, and then we're going to do some hard work of thinking about what is preaching going to sound like post-pandemic. Here's how preaching has evolved for me. It started out, one, as institutional maintenance. Institutional maintenance. That is, I was called to my first church, and there were things about that church that needed to be developed, and in that season, these were the metrics for institutional success. They were church programming, discipleship, ministry building, courage to build, and I'm talking about square footage, courage to build and expand, a child of God's commitment to God in participating, watch these words, participating in institutional priorities. Do you understand what I mean by that? Institutional, I only heard one year. Do I need to further explain that? All right, here's what I mean. There was a time where the priority placed on preaching and pastoral responsibility was in what I call institutional maintenance. That is, getting people committed to coming to the building as much as possible, to participate in church programming, discipleship formation, outreach programs, 
and fellowship. Those were the priorities of a successful church. It was how many times does brother or sister so-and-so feel compelled to come to the church? And we didn't care if they had five kids who didn't finish their homework because they were down there on Monday night for choir rehearsal. Tuesday night they were there for ministry meeting. Wednesday night they were there for Bible study. Thursday they were there for outreach, packed food for those we were giving out for the weekend. Friday they would come to prayer meeting. Saturday we had them at Bible training union. Sunday we had them at church. And oh, you ain't really holy unless you stay for all three services. <laughs> and then we have dinner, and then you got Baptist training union after that, and then you had night service. And we would measure success. Basically, here's how you got to become a deacon or a deaconess or a ministry leader. We, we figured out how tired we made you. And the more fatigued you were, the more worn out you were from institutional connectivity, we equated that to deep spirituality. So there was a season when that was the metric of church growth, right? Institutional maintenance. Now we see this, for example, like in the Acts of the Apostles. And in each of these categories, I give you like the biblical connectivity out of which much of the preachment would come. So this would be the Acts of the Apostles where we would put folk on the guilt trip. Well, after all, brothers and sisters, remember the early children of God did not forsake the assembling of themselves together. They met together daily in the homes for fellowship, study of the word, prayer, right? And we put folk on the guilt trip for making them think that if I'm holy, it is measured by institutional commitment. So that was my early stages in ministry. Then it kind of morphed, it segued from institutional maintenance into what I'm gonna put in the category of an evangelistic priority. And that was the winning souls to Christ. Some of you will remember words like this. It was making your church seeker friendly. You remember those terms? It was making your church seeker friendly. It focused on approaches to ministry, kind of a, a consumer driven preoccupation. Why was that? Because salvation was then measured by church growth, church involvement. We knew how many members you had. We didn't know how many of them were saved. Is what my doctoral professor, Dr. William Augustus Jones, would then say when asked by people in the second half of his life, Dr. Jones, how many members do you have at Bethany? And he would say, well, that depends. Are you asking me how many I count or how many I weigh? Because if I count them, it is far more than how many weigh anything. I will. Dr. Jones said, it's not just what you count, it's what you weigh. Because I have many more members than have weightedness spiritually, right? My registry has thousands of people on it. But in COVID, when it came down to who is the committed core, that was significantly smaller, right? So there was this focus on church growth only measured by who was in attendance in the building. Now this is the 90s when the tech boom was hitting. So people were successful and people were making money and they were, it was easy to find a job. So it was that, here's the biblical connectivity to that. It was the discipleship model where Jesus says of potential disciples, come and see. And then after a little while, come follow me. And then prayerfully it's come be with me. And finally it is go be me. That was the big discipleship model in the second stage of my ministry evolution. Then Rodney King happened. So then there was this bend towards a preoccupation for what we called preaching prophetically. 
Ronald Reagan went into office, Rodney King, the Bushes, the war on crime, which was really, many of us consider that to have been the war on African Americans. And as a result of that, the big preoccupation was, are you charismatic in your preaching or are you prophetic? And again, I'm not making a judgment statement, I'm describing. Prophetic was, do you in your homiletical presentation give consistent critique of the dominant culture? Me and Pastor Allen were talking earlier that one of the issues I have with social justice on any side of the street that we stand on is I'm all for the critique and I'm all for speaking truth to power and I'm all for fighting against uh, systemic evils. But what I don't see that is connected to the Old Testament prophet's tradition is not just the critique, and the call for repentance, I don't see the painting of an alternative vision. And for me, if you are prophetic, then you're not just good at examining unto a critique, but there has to be the painting of an alternative vision. If, if you're telling us what's wrong, tell us how God wants us to make it right and what does right look like. Am I making any sense? All right, so that was the prophetic tradition. We moved from that in the early 2000s to what I would call the doctrinal preoccupation. And this is where I saw the beginning of spiritual pluralism in the early 2000s. Preaching forced an angle of exegesis focused on explaining doctrine, election, conversion, sanctification, repentance, forgiveness, deep issues of sexuality, and the like. So there was a heavy doctrinal preoccupation. And this is when um, texts that come out of the epistles began to dominate homiletical presentation. Pre-pandemic, I described preaching as consumer-friendly up until 2019. It was consumer-friendly. And this was the pulpit's response to cultural criticism, where we forgot that Christianity was always a militant movement, y'all. Let me come to this side. They didn't. <laughs> Christianity was always a militant movement. It was never a movement that took its, its cues from the consumer. Uh, that's the term I use because it meant, this is when you had to make sure you had coffee in the vestibule and popcorn after the benediction and blow up floats for the kids. And I'm not knocking any of that again. I'm not making criticisms because Paul says I gotta do a whole lot of things to win some. So I'm not knocking that. What I'm saying is the preoccupation was then on how do we attract people to the campus, which meant it was consumer driven. It also bordered on forgetting that preaching often caused people to have to shake hands with conviction before it caused them to be happy about attraction, right? And as a result of that, the culture started measuring the success of churches on metrics that in many instances had nothing to do with the integrity of its preaching. I go to such and such a church because they got this big parking lot. They do a carnival after they finish. You know, they built this big wing for the kids and they painted it. It's got all these Disney themes inside of it. I got a friend in the Dallas, Texas area who uh, entered into a partnership with SeaWorld and they've got in their construction, they built an aquarium that goes around the entire church and SeaWorld maintenances animals there. He uses that for the whole, um, I'll make you fishers of men kind of motif and all that. But wow, so many members go because of the attraction of that. And as a result, then they're sitting there as a consumer and they're saying to you, keep feeding me the attractions. Right? I'm not, again, I'm not criticizing, I'm just describing. Because all of us fell, fell victim to having to shape ministry in these ways. This indicted us, in my estimation, of not being too systemically narrow, and I get that. Less acts at the root of the tree, a softer, kinder, gentler 
preaching presentation of the gospel. You know, it's the whole, well, Jesus said, I have sheep that you know not of. You know, all that kind of stuff. All right, so that, that was doctrinal, pre-pandemic. Then March 2020 hit. I can still remember the day, that Saturday morning, getting off the plane, having, pre having preached three nights for a dear friend in Marstown, New Jersey, standing Saturday night in my pulpit, standing Sunday morning, and not realizing when I gave the benediction at the 1030 service on that Sunday morning that that would be the last time I would see my congregation in mass for 18 months. You could have never told me that I would have ever navigated ministry where I would not see my congregation in physical presence for 18 months. You could have never told me that I would do 18 months in my sanctuary looking at a camera and having to develop a whole different modality for how to communicate the gospel in an empty sanctuary. I can, I can still remember the eerie feeling of, is this the end of the institutional church? And I remember what it meant for me homiletically, because whatever else I had preached up until March 2020, there was now this need to be Harry Emerson Fosdickian. Meaning, my homiletics had to be what? Cathartic. Therapeutic. I had to help people navigate trauma. Every single day, members of my congregation were texting, calling, emailing with members of their family who were transitioning from COVID. Where I had to do funerals, where I could be the only person in the funeral home, and everybody else had to be virtual. I had members, when we finally um, went back to in-person service, my staff said, Pastor, if we don't have something that helps the members to even know who transitioned, we're going to have a secondary trauma when folk come back to church. So when we did our virtual annual church conference where we revealed the next year's budget and vision and all that stuff, we did an in memoriam towards the end where we showed as many pictures as families entrusted to us of people who transitioned over those, that two-year span. And the purging online was eerie. The crying and screaming, the comments of, I didn't know so-and-so died. I found myself in the same place where I would run into members after they came back and I'll give you a, a little pastoral secret that with every one of your members, one of the ways you stay personal with them or personal bold with them is at least try to remember one thing about them. And for 20 years, just keep asking them the same thing. So it starts out like, how's that new car you bought last week? 20 years later, it's, how's that antique car you had? And, me and remember, it's, it's amazing. Members would be like, you still remember that car, Pastor? I'd be like, yeah, man, I remember that car. Because that's the only thing I remember about you, right? <laughs> so, I would, so I would run across members and I'd be like, how's your dad? Pastor, you buried my dad in February. But I'm so used to being able to connect the coffin to the front row. And there was no front row for me for 18 months, right? So it, had to, it changed my whole modality. Here's my point. As it related to preaching, it had to be much more therapeutic, much more cathartic. It had to bend towards crisis management. There was an intent then to homiletically interpret with a theological rationale based upon the pandemic. Many people were asking this question, why did God allow this? Who was God attempting to punish? And if God was intentional about the pandemic, how do we describe the enemy? Because people are dying in every camp. So these were the questions that people were asking. I give all of that as a backdrop so that we can get to the now. I describe this space that we're in right now homiletically as proclamation in liminal space. Proclamation in liminal space. How many have heard this word liminal before? 
All right, proclamation in liminal space. Here's, here's the best base definition of liminal. liminal. It is standing on the border of transition, surrounded by mystery. One more time. Base definition of liminal. Standing on the border of transition, surrounded by mystery. See, it's one thing to stand on the border of transition knowing what I'm getting ready to step into. Liminal, however, is when I'm standing on the border of transition and I know I have to step, but I have no idea of what that step is going to mean for me. This is the space we are in right now. Because we just don't know. We don't know what church is going to look like in the next five years. We don't know what our lives, we can prognosticate. We can try to take the temperature to suggest, as many have done through statistical data, that many preachers are going to be bivocational, that there'll be no need to build churches with these big sprawling sanctuaries anymore. We can prognosticate that we're going to be hybrid for the rest of our, you know, I, I would say for the rest of our generation. We're probably going to be hybrid. You've got to learn how to navigate digital space. That if you haven't created a strong online platform, you are behind. Right? That your members have multiple influential homiletical voices now. Because one thing pandemic allowed them to do was to have sermon on demand. Which meant all the years you've have, you have invested to create a dominant theological theme, a dominant homiletical theme, a dominant exegetical theme, now they are drinking from multiple wells. Which means they are now listening to you, not just to receive, but also to inspect. Because they're matching it against the plethora of sermons that they hear. And you know it because they will say, Pastor, I heard you today. I was listening to so-and-so on Tuesday, and they said something different about that text. Then there was a time where if you had a devoted member of your church, they only thought you could be their authoritative voice. And everything else they would not hear. But now, my sheep know a whole lot of voices. <laughs> and all of them, they will follow when they call, right? <laughs> I'm just playing. No, I'm not. <laughs> right? So we're on the border of this transition. Now I want to return to what I said kind of ancill ancillary a little earlier. Todd Bolzinger has written a book entitled Canoeing the Mountain. I would recommend it strongly to each one of you, Canoeing the Mountain. In it, he really is um, talking about adaptive leadership. He uses as the dominant image the exploration of Lewis and Merriweather. The point he makes in Canoeing the Mountain is this. The world in front of you is nothing like the world behind you. Everybody say with me, the world in front of you is nothing like the world behind you. When I do pastors' conferences here, and it still amazes me, people's reaction to this statement. Everything you know about your profession, everything that was so comfortable for you pre-pandemic, eulogize it. Eulogize it. Do what Paul said, forget those things that are behind you. Because what you're going to have to do with this canoe, he uses this image of this exploration where Lewis and Merriweather reached the Rocky Mountains, They've navigated their distance to date on a water passageway. Now they encounter these mountains. It was unintended. And they carry the canoes to the apex of the first mountain, thinking that they're going to descend on the other side, return to a waterway passage, and continue their journey. Much to their surprise, however, as far as the eye can see, there is nothing but mountains. 
and they're standing there holding these canoes and they've got to make a critical decision. Do we continue to carry these canoes hoping that we're going to get back to normal? Do we discard these canoes and interpret that we will never need them again? Or do we repurpose these canoes and find usefulness for them for the journey across these mountains? And his, of course, what he's postulating is adaptive leadership, particularly for those of us who are in pastoral ministry, is not to discard the canoe, but it is also not to keep carrying it across the mountains, but to repurpose it to benefit our continued journey. Does that make sense? And then here's what he says critical of this. He says, as you're leading your congregation, the only way your congregations will follow you on the other side of this liminal space, whatever is on the other side of this threshold, once we can really determine that it's post-pandemic, the only way they're going to follow you is if you have had integrity with them in your leadership pre-pandemic. He uses different terms, though. He says the only way they'll follow you off the map is because you have been trustworthy with your leadership with them on the map. So if while on the map, your congregation has not developed deep anchoring for spiritual conviction, a trust for Jesus Christ and a commitment to the gospel, if they didn't develop that before the pandemic, no wonder they're not watching your stream or continuing to give, even though not having returned to the building yet because they're not trusting you in little space. They're in this place called mystery, which means then any prognosticator, any person diagnosing, any person who is saying, here's what it's gonna be like, becomes an authoritative voice for them. Does that make sense? All right, so, whatever this creative, imaginative space that we are headed towards, whatever it demands of us, homiletically and in terms of a pastoral modality, all of us are operating with that and in search of it in a space of mystery, revisiting the definition of church. What does it mean to be church? In fact, how do you even define it? So in March 2020, when I had to shut down, I knew I needed to do something to connect my members and to at least let them hear my voice. I started a nightly prayer call. 7 o'clock, 7.30. I had to do two because there was limits on the, on the line that I could use. And my congregation, the, the numbers filled the first one, so I had to start a second one. And I made the mistake. I was telling Pastor Allen this early. I made the mistake. Don't do this. Don't make promises prematurely in liminal space because you might have to stay committed to them, right? This was called pastoral foot in pastoral mouth. I said second night that I was on a prayer call, brothers and sisters, as long as we are in this pandemic, Monday through Friday, 7 o'clock and 7.30, I will be on this line with a meditation and a prayer. Hung the, hung the phone up. I just thought we'd be in it for a month, two months at best. At the third month, I'm like, okay, God, you got jokes. The fourth month, I'm like, God, really? The first year, I'm like, God, can I break a covenant? 18 months. And then what ended up happening is members would start commenting and making comments like this. I live alone. I'm in the house every day. And the only voice I hear on a daily basis is your voice. You believe, can you believe that? I mean, I had my wife, and we were, you know, after the second week, she was like, you ain't got no revival to go to? Like, like, don't nobody want you to take a risk and come? Right? <laughs> so 18 months, I'm stuck on the phone. I shouldn't term it like that, but I mean, it's the truth. I'm stuck on the phone, getting up 4.30 every morning, writing a complete meditation, writing out my prayers, 
and so that I can make sure that I'm prepared, not redundant. I mean, after 18 months, I mean, you're getting on the phone. What do you say? Like, hey, you know, what I said two months ago on the second, do it again, right? <laughs> so trying to come up and be creative and imaginative space. And for 18 months, they kept following. And I learned something. Here's what I'm trying to get to. I learned that for 20, at that point, 23 years, I had misdefined church. I thought church was who gathered. And it hit me. Church is not necessarily who gathers. Church is who connects. It wasn't who gathered. It was who connects. Now, that has radically altered me in this space I'm in right now because I'm challenging my staff against the backdrop of something that we didn't necessarily we didn't think would be possible prior to this. We kept asking ourselves for the last several years because we get a lot of online viewers. And many of them would ask questions in the chat while they were watching services. Listen, I live in Detroit, Michigan, but I'd like to be a member of Mount Eric. Could I be a member of your church living in Detroit? Prior to the pandemic, we were challenging each other as a staff, like how do we answer that question? And you know why it was difficult for us? Because we felt at some point that if you wanted to be a disciple of Mount Ararat, you got to be in the building at some point. But then I learned that for 18 months, I was equipping disciples who couldn't come to the building and creating opportunities of connectivity for them that had nothing to do with coming to 279 Paulson Avenue. Are you following me? So it radically changed our whole idea of what it means to be a member of Mount Ararat and what it means for us to offer discipleship. I still think. I, I still prefer for people to gather together, but we've got members sprawled all across the world who are saying to us by virtue of their connectivity virtually, I want to be a disciple. I want to benefit from fellowship. I want to offer my stewardship to your ministry. I want to be equipped and I want to participate in ministry. This is what they're asking us in digital space. And I got to answer that question and I have to create and we are creating a modality that does that. Couldn't have, I, I would have never imagined that that would have been a part of ministry exploration three years ago. Yet, that's the space that we're in right now. So we had to redefine what it means to be church. And I love this space because it gave me an opportunity to say to many ministries, well, you know, now that we're in this space, we're going to let this ministry lay in a dormant space and when we come out, we're going to revisit whether this is really legitimate. And when I looked at my budget and saw how much money we were putting to things that really don't keep us connected, we were able to save so much money in 2020 and 2021 that it scared me. I asked my CFO, when I got the end of the year number and I looked at the revenue over expenses, I was like, Venetia, can you go back and do that one more time? He said, Pastor, I've been working for you for 15 years. The number is the number. I said, okay, just one more, just scrub it one more time. I said, Pastor, I don't know why you're making me do this. Number comes out the same, and I'm like, I just don't get it. I, I'm scratching my head, like, how do we save that much money? And she's like, well, remember, we don't have a ministry meeting every night that we got to feed them a full dinner. <laughs> or we're not sponsoring this where we got to give Google Ops the money to this. And when we looked at the things that we thought were essential, that turned out in COVID that nobody has even mentioned or mourned is not around. Oh, yeah. That now when I have staff saying, Pastor, nobody's asking to do such and such, I said, well, don't say anything. Shh. <laughs> Shh. Let it slide into the abyss. <laughs> right? I had my annual church meeting virtually this year, and when members didn't ask certain questions, and my sons and daughters in the ministry are, are always asking, like, why did you let that question just go on that long? I said, y'all don't understand. If the church wants to spend 25 minutes talking about something that's not essential to the program that I just asked them to give me $4 million for, let them talk. <laughs> are you following me? All right, so revisiting the definition of church, Settling the issues of technology, prophetic response to other kind of injustices now like health care injustices, and here we go. The big question is, what preaching 
modality is awaiting us. We talked about what was, we talked about what is, what preaching modality is awaiting us? And I'll give you my short list and I will open us for conversation. Number one, I think a preaching modality that is creatively imaginative. That's number one, creatively imaginative. Now for my African-American pastors in the room, they will understand this comment. All your vocal theatrics, COVID I know taught you, not one person in liminal space cared at all whether you tuned it up. <laughs> Have I got a witness? Ooh, I'm about to close right now. <laughs> Is there anybody in the building that will help me lift Jesus? And everybody looking on the screen like, we ain't in the building. <laughs> It didn't, it didn't matter. It disappeared, right? All of that disappeared in one swell swoop of a pandemic. So preaching more, you, you have right now, if never before, if I was talking to a, a group of seminary students who were entering in and taking my preaching class for the very first semester, I would say to them, I'm gonna answer the question that is asked of, that has been asked of me for the last 10, 15 years, but I'm answering it differently now. I'm always asked by younger preachers, um, teach me your preaching modality. How do you write your sermon? How do you explore the text? How, what does it sound like, whatever? And I will say to them, you don't wanna preach like me. I wanna sit and ask you, what should preaching sound like right now? What style should it be communicated in? Because any advice I would give you will outdate you. I'm 55 years old. My voice has been set for the last 38 years. My model has been there for the last 38 years. I'm trying to listen to preachers who are creatively imaginative. And I'm not talking about stage decoration and aesthetics. I'm not talking about attire. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the way preachers are approaching texts and giving out information, proclaiming the gospel, raising congregations, handling scripture, I am curious to hear and to see how preachers are doing that in this generation, particularly as we are on the verge prayerfully of being a post-pandemic church. So one preaching modality is to be creative and imaginative, and you will never have this opportunity. No, I'll take that back. You may not have this opportunity again. Now, God, please, I pray that we don't have another pandemic but they say every two years, one comes. We, we sometimes have offset them because we've been able to make some real responsible decisions before they become global like this one has. But pandemics are always on the horizon, right? But I just pray we don't have another one like COVID-19, which means you are in a space where you have the opportunity to be as authentic as you can be. Take advantage of it, because it hasn't been like that forever. And it may not in our generation be like that again. Write the vision and what? That's the part that I always have to remind people that the B, the B clause is, is as important as the A clause. Everybody gets stuck on, write the, write the vision. Shonda Labosha, Iba Shondo. <laughs> write the vision. That's good. But the second part of that is equally as important. Make it plain. I can tell you the distinctive for me homiletically at this stage of my life. I've spent the first half of my life trying to make the profound truths of the Bible, trying to make the, the simple truths of the Bible profound, trying to wrap big words around it, trying to make it poetic, using alliterations, quoting poets and scholars, trying to sound, trying to demonstrate that my money was worth it, graduating from three institutions, right? That was the first half, trying to make the simple profound. At this stage of my life, I'm trying to make the profound simple. Here's what the text says. 
here's what the text means, and here's how you practically live it out. Here's how your theology becomes praxis. This is how you make flesh from the word, right? So be creatively imaginative. You may not have this kind of liberation to do that any, again. Here's the second part, and they're gonna get deeper as we go along. Here's the second part. Preaching modality, as we're ending the pandemic coming out of it, is gonna have to be apologetic. Everybody say apologetic. Now, some of you may disagree with me. I'd be interested in conversation around this, and we could come back to it, or we can pause and discuss it. The Christian church in 2022 is not in the popular position of primary authority. I'll say it again. The Christian church in 2020, 22, is not in a position of primary authority. There was a time that if you transitioned from one city to another and you engaged conversation with a coworker because it was the job that forced you to transition or invited you to transition, conversation would go something like this. Where are you from? Oh, I'm from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. What brought you to Madison? Oh, my job. They gave him a promotion, moved the family out here. What church are you going to go to? Oh, we found a church around the corner, wonderful church, great Sunday school. They got a whole wing where they have the Disney thing in down there. <laughs> they got, they got blow-up floats outside at the service. They serve popcorn. They Starbucks right in the middle of the vestibule. Is that right? I got to visit that church myself. That would be, you know, maybe question number two or three that would come up. Now, when folk go to cities, where are you from? Pittsburgh. We brought you to Madison. Job transition. He gave me elevation, gave me a raise, brought the family out here. Oh, you know, they got an L.A. fitness around the corner from where you're moving. The mall is right down the street. They do jazz outside in the park, not too far from where you're living. Do tell. And church may or may not come up in conversation. When things are happening globally now, notice, very rarely, if ever, is there any commentary from the voice of clergy. We might be quoted locally, but in national politics and global issues, you're not, you, you don't see clergy, and the clergy they choose are stars. They're celebrities. They're not the people doing the grunt work. They, they predominantly are not the people doing grunt work like we're doing in the local church every single day. These are the megastars of the Christian pulpit. So we're not in the popular position, the authoritative position that we were in before. Here's what it means. It means homiletically, y'all, we are perhaps for the first time in our generation, we are defending the gospel. We're defending the gospel. We are bringing the gospel to the table and telling the authorities around the table, consider this. Because popular cultural conversation is not even inserting it in its dialogue. Now, let me give an example of what I'm talking about. I'm a tech person. I, I'm a co-founder of a technical company that does online streaming and book publishing and website development and social media management and crisis image repair for clergy and churches across the world. And so when I do workshops that deal with technology, I use this as a way of us understanding what is happening. Techno-philanthropists who don't have to deal with government regulations are pushing the edge on so many things because they're exploring the future in ways that will stave off decrepitude, help us to live a whole lot longer, and recycle things in the earth and all that. And I'm with all of that. But if you think about something like the electric car, okay? The te let's use Tesla for an example. Tesla has to be programmed. The programmers who work for the company are gonna shape the computer responses of that car based on some ethical metrics. There is a gap right now in the electric car for whether or not the car can respond to unexpected emergency occurrences. 
like. That car is made to stop when it sees an object that it's getting ready to run into. But it has a 2.4 second delay, which means there is an instance, a potentiality where on this side is a 30-year-old female, just had a baby, she's pushing the stroller, she's out walking, and unfortunately her phone rang just as she was about to move the baby carriage off the curb, and she got so distracted by the phone call that she didn't look to see where cars were coming either way, and she's pushing the carriage and herself right out into the middle of the street, in which time, in that 2.4 seconds, the Tesla is coming. On this side is an elderly lady, 80 years old, and she had just come out of the grocery store, and she has a courage with all of her groceries in it, and she wasn't paying attention because when she saw the curve, she was so preoccupied by making sure she got down off of that curve without falling that she wasn't paying attention to the traffic coming either way, and she steps on the street at the same time, and that day, somebody has to die. The car is going to make a choice. One of the two is going to to die. Now, here's the question I ask you, Pastor. Not one of us, in terms of influence, is at the table influencing the ethical decisions that are being made by the techno-philanthropists. Why do I say that? Because they have already confessed that we are not part of their consideration. The predominant amount of their writings have already revealed that religion is something that they are working diamet diametrically opposed to. But they have to make a decision. Now the question becomes, who dies? Well, it depends on the ethical mores, the pillars they have ethically. If they think, as our media portrays, that old people are to be relegated to the side, see, not heard, no longer relevant, enjoy your retirement, we're going to put you in a special spot, play your golf at the golf course, leave us alone. Because our culture values youth and beauty. And it's why you can see a commercial about something that really is ageless, but it's going to be promoted by somebody who is the best object in the gym you could have ever seen. You'd be selling cigarettes, and it's got to be a pretty woman. Right? Because we value youth and beauty. So the programmer sitting there in front of his or her computer has to make a decision as to how to program that vehicle. Do I value youth? Do I value an elder? Some might say, she lived her life, let the Tesla hit her. Some might say, she's too young to have really made an impact on culture. The baby just got here. Let the Tesla hit them. The decision has to be made. Here's my point. While the decision has to be made, my question is, where are Christians in the conversation? I'll give you another one that pushes it even further. My daughter's a med student finishing up at Temple University. She has a semester where they're dealing with genetic manipulation. They did an experiment. She went to Villanova undergrad, and as part of an internship, she did an experiment where they wanted to turn worm blood into what would be usable for transfusions for soldiers who would need blood on the battlefield. So, you know, thank God her name is on the study and all that. I'm teasing her like, Houston, if something happens to me and they tell me I need blood and you put worm blood in me, I'm coming back to haunt you every day of your adult life. Do not be putting no worm. And you know what she said to me? If worm blood keeps you alive, daddy, worm blood is going all in your veins. And then we met in the middle, well that's okay, because his blood will never lose his power. <laughs> Right? So she's doing a study. So we got into this discussion, and she says, Daddy, you have no idea what's happening with genetic manipulation. We are experimenting with the idea that people in the future will be able to design genetically their child. Now, the initial explanation for that is so that we can get out in front of what would be genetic diseases and stave them off before the fetus is fully developed. But we know in a Western capitalist society where money is God, that there are people who are gonna create a hierarchical structure with that, and depending upon how much money you have, you can also design a super athlete. 
or design super brilliance. You weren't good at math in college and you got enough money, genetically manipulate your child, make your child good at math. You didn't like the fact that you had brown eyes, you always wish you had green eyes. You got enough money, put it on your insurance, make sure your child has green eyes. You have short hair, but you want your child to have long hair? No problem. You want to be muscular. You want to be 6'1", you want to be 6'2". You want to have predisposition for football, basketball, or golf. Because if it was me, I'm telling you what I'm going to have. Six foot five, they're going to play golf. And I want them to have a draw that, go, that only has a six-yard dispersion so that when they play in the Masters, they can take it right on around that corner. That's my little personal thing. And so I would, I would pay for that. The point I'm trying to make is this. When does that border on wandering outside the avenues of my grace is sufficient and my strength is made perfect in what? Not in human perfection, but in human weakness because it's when I'm weak that I'm strong. If we stave off decrepitude, and say to a person that for a right amount of money, you don't even have to die, that you can live forever. What happens to the hope of heaven? What happens to, I fought a good fight and I kept the faith. I finished my course. What happens to an apostle Paul who says, I don't know whether I want to be alive or whether I want to die because to live is Christ and to die is gain. What happens to that? What happens to faith when Google is trying to figure out how to put the internet in your brain? And you'll have the capacity to just download whatever theological thoughts, theological arguments. And in fact, you don't have to listen to a William Curtis because his theological connectivity is limited only to those he has read and been exposed to. But if you got Google in the brain, all the voices that have contributed to the theological academy are now able to be downloaded into your brain. Well, what happens to faith? Seeking understanding. And we're not even part of the conversation. That's the point I want to make. All right, so it has to be apologetic. What time? Oh my God. You, you know what, let me pause and open for discussion and questions because I think we only have like 10 minutes before the 2.15 mark. Okay, and then, then I'll pick it up and I'll add it to the front end of the church yeah. component. Oh, am Wonderful, I actually, thank you. You, you stay up there. Down? No, 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 are, oh. you, are you good standing up there? Fantastic. <laughs> We got a couple of mics. We'll come and run around. I'm going to come to this side. Pastor Allen will stay over here. Um, raise your hand and we'll come to you. And I'll let you stay over here. Perfect. Dr. Curtis, uh, you mentioned about the clergy not being a part of those conversations in those spaces uh, and how important it is to have that online social media presence. Do you feel that the clergy needs to be intentional in its presentation on social media and various spaces, trying to reach that specific group of people? I do. I, I honestly believe that we have, that we are forgetting that we are the salt of the earth. And we're following the trends of culture that makes stuff like social media tempting us to promote us as opposed to promoting the Christ that we are attempting to proclaim. So for me, social media is content driven and not image driven, right? And I have people ask me all the time, you never put pictures of yourself on there or you, know, you in action shots and all that stuff because it's not about me, it's about the content. I'm trying to use that for content dissemination, right? Rather than image. Other questions? Tell, tell, me your, tell me your name again. Christopher James? Yeah, Christopher James. I'm, I'm going to put a little pressure on him because he made the mistake of telling me that he's a seminary professor. Um, so I might be getting an honorarium, but he's going to partner with me for this. <laughs> so t tell me what you hear, how you hear it, and how this relates to students. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, Actually, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pose it to you as a question because that's what I was ruminating on right when you, when you called me. You, you made um, some compelling descriptions of the way that the 
human situation, the human condition of the preacher is a filter through which the word comes to the people. I'd actually love to hear you talk about, um, and you did in some ways, but talk about how the human situation of the people is also a filter that the preacher is bringing to uh, their, their waiting for the word to open up, as mm -hmm. he said, uh, and, so that's and demand a, to be preached. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So there's this model that I, that I teach um, pastoral leaders that there was a season where success in pastoral model was the preacher above the congregation, bidding the congregation to rise. There's a second modality where the preacher is ahead of the congregation, bidding the congregation to come. What helps you to have the best homiletical lens is to be among the congregation, listening to where the congregation is, right? And as I spend time with my congregation, I get to hear what are the ruminating issues of their lives, what are the fears and anxieties. It almost can shape sermonic content for me if I'm among the congregation. And then at the appointed time, I stand upon the tower, cast the glance forward, and call the congregation to follow God's vision. Absolutely. I think, I think the way you illustrated that earlier of uh, the questions that you heard bubbling up among your congregation during the pandemic. Why did God let this happen? Who's God trying to punish? Those questions no doubt nagged you as you encountered the text right? Um, and, and found their way into being spoken to. Absolutely. So I think that's, that's just an important thing to, to highlight. We are ourselves a filter, but so too are our people Absolutely. a filter for um, how we are coming to scripture and asking what God has to say to God's people. Absolutely. Yep. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Curtis, you had mentioned in preaching after March 2020 mm -hmm. that your preaching was uh, cathartic and uh, dealt with identifying with the people right. what's going on. Where do you see the role of, say, psychology integrated with theology or, or mental health in, in this area we're getting ready to go into this ministry? That's a, that's a great question. I'm going to answer it in two ways. One, I'm going to answer that by saying we, who have been seminary trained and theologically trained, we are not therapists and we are not psychologists and we shouldn't act like we are, right? So I don't do, I don't, I don't use terminology of diagnosis. I don't use therapeutic terms, but I will marry to that that we preachers who are faithful to exegeting passages become by default cathartic because the Bible is therapeutic, right? That if I'm faithful to the text, it is going to have a cathartic and therapeutic, it's gonna call for that kind of response from the hearer, no matter what, right? But I think we have to really be clear. We have a counseling center and I'm very clear when people come to see me, I am an expert in spiritual encouragement sessions, which means I'm using the Bible for us to examine what you say you're struggling with, and I'm here to pray for you. And you don't get more than two sessions with me. And after that second session, if there is a need for you still to talk to somebody, I have to refer you to the counseling center, because that's not my job, right? Now, that's on the one side. On a, in a very practical sense, y'all, understand on the other side that we live in a litigious society. You can mess around if you want to and sit in one of your counseling sessions because you're so deep and spiritual and say to the person, well, yeah, I just think you're suffering from anxiety. And then the person goes home and writes their suicide note, went to church today, talked to Pastor Curtis, he said, I'm suffering from society, anxiety, I can't deal with this, and then we find they killed themselves the night before, and now that family has you in court because you made a diagnosis. And that diagnosis may have taken a person emotionally down until they decided to do something. You are a spiritual advisor. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit later in the church section that I'd be happy to hear Dr. James's comments regarding. I'm going to talk a little bit later about what, what the pandemic has done. Because we've lost first position, we are at best, our best place in the modern culture, in my estimation, this is my um, assumption, our best place is as ethical mentors. Since we've lost trying to regain authority, since we are preaching to and leading 
what I would suggest is a biblically illiterate culture predominantly, we are ethical mentors. I'll pick up on that in the next session and talk about that. But be very careful about marrying therapy and theology unless that is your training. And well, why, why are you at, you made me go through that whole explanation. Ooh, how long shall I suffer with you? How long shall I I just wanted to hear where you were at. Pastor <laughs> Allen. Dr. Dr. Curtis, as we uh, seek to be creatively imaginative, how do we uh, resist the temptation of coming across as chasing or following trends? We want to be relevant in our creative imagination in right. preaching, but how do we uh, ma maintain relevance without appearing as if we're just following trends okay. or being trendy in great our preaching? Question. That's a great question. So here, here's the acid test. Filter what you are considering through the authenticity of your personality. And if anything you're considering makes you have to make space for it, meaning it's not naturally comfortable, then treat it with a hermeneutic of suspicion. Right? Now, I'm not saying at times you don't take risk. I'm not saying at times that you don't have to step out of your comfort zone. But when I have to sacrifice the authenticity of my personality to do it, I'm, I'm starting to get in shaky water there, right? When I can't be me, like, like I, got, I got called to preach when I was 15. My pastor wouldn't let me preach till I was 17. So I didn't grow up, I grew up in the age of hip hop, but I didn't grow up listening to hip hop. I grew up listening to Peter and John's st uh, gospel station in Baltimore. So, I, I mean, I knew sh the Strawberry Hill gang, but I, don't, I can't remember anything. Say hip hop, hibbity, 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 hop, hop, don't stop. That's all I know, right? And then I don't know anything else. So, in a season, when I'm trying to be relevant, right, to my young people, I looked up a couple rap stars and I put a couple of their lyrics in there. And some of my young adults came to me and they're like, Pastor, can we talk to you for a minute? I came down from the pulpit, yes, brothers and sisters, what, what can I do for you? Because I try to be articulate and erudite and all that stuff. And they said, don't do that no more. I said, why? They was like, because people were texting on the phone, like, fake, fake, fake. Just, just be you. We don't come. This is what they said. We don't come to church for that. We come to church for you to lift our vocabulary, not lower it. You're talking about convicted, out of the mouth of babes, right? And, you know, and you still try to have some authority. That's when you walk away talking about, I would take that under advisement. <laughs> <laughs> right? So when, when it costs you, when it costs you your personality to do it, then question it.